love it. I love it when we get down to the hardcore. These are the hardcore warriors who are staying for the last plenary. Thanks for being here. And, and frankly, I think that this is going to be the most rewarding. Those of you who were at the dinner last night, I, I spoke about knowledge and how knowledge only in the head is insufficient, but knowledge in the heart is also as important. And we're going to personalize today all of the things that we've been talking about. And I think you'll see that the discussion here reflects all the values that all of us carry around with us every day. We're having a panel discussion. It's called The Journey of an Injury. It'll take us from an injury to the new normal for a family who undergoes many layers of treatment and rehabilitation through many organizations. This will be a panel chaired by Dr. Byron Hepburn. Byron's a Major General Retired Air Force. Uh, after retiring from the Air Force, he became the Associate Vice President and the first director of the Military Health Institute at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center uh, here in San Antonio. Uh, his job is integrating, uh, his job is working for our last speaker to integrate military and civilian health research, uh, clinical uh, education, uh, and he is the professor of family and community medicine there. With no further ado, Byron, it's yours. Thank you, Admiral Cowan. Why don't we let's get our panelists up, and uh, Melissa, come on up, and Dr. Halmai, please be seated. Well, good morning, and I'm really, really happy that uh, we have such a good presence for a Friday morning. I, I know in my day, when I was a young Iron Major, I'd probably be uh, teeing off right now on Friday morning, so. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, I'm glad they're videoing this uh, journey, too, because uh, I want to make sure that when you all leave here, you go back to your respective units or companies or organizations or academic institutions and uh, have them link on to this um, journey that we're going to talk about this morning. Um, as Admiral Cowan just mentioned, um, it's so important to get to why. And this week has been tremendous. Uh, the breadth and depth of the academic and uh, professional discussions, operational, garrison care, the industry piece we saw in the exhibit hall, uh, the academic piece that was in the poster presentations and all the poster presentations speak to this interwoven fabric. But getting to why is what it's all about. And Sergeant, Staff Sergeant Christian Baggy and his wife Melissa are why, and their children, Noah and Bryn, or why we're here today, why we serve around the globe, and our international partners as well. So uh, I have an honor today to chair this distinguished panel. First off, you know, and the most importantly, is Staff Sergeant Christian Baggy and his wife, Melissa. Christian and Melissa hail from Mosier, Oregon, up in the beautiful Northwest. Staff Sergeant Baggy was seriously injured in Iraq in 2005, and he'll speak to it better than I, but underwent multiple surgeries, treatments, uh, and has done exceptionally well, but I want to let him speak to his journey personally. Uh, and he's recently moved back with his, his family back here to San Antonio. And they have two beautiful children. You'll see their photo here in a second. And uh, we're honored to have both of you with us this morning. Let's give him a round of applause. First academic panelist will be Lieutenant Colonel Mike Davis, who is a deputy commander of the Institute of Surgical Research over Joint Base Force Santa Houston. And he's an accomplished plastic surgeon and researcher. Mike has deployed multiple times, and he'll speak from the heart about that care at point of injury, the stabilization of the wounded warrior, the preparation to move on a CCAT back to the United States. And I think he'll touch on also the incredible research that's being done at the ISR and across the United States and internationally, because a lot of this work is being done internationally. So Dr. Mike Davis. Mr. John Ferguson is the chief prosthetist at the Center for the Intrepid, San Antonio Military Medical Center. John is an accomplished and compassionate clinician as well. And I think he's going to underscore today that there is a lot of technology in this. And we've heard that this week uh, with our colleagues in the various outbreaks. But um, the human element has been repeated over and over again. And I think John will touch on that, uh, that part of the healing journey as well. And then we'll wrap up with Dr. Jane Halmai who is the medical director of the Polytrauma Transitional Rehabilitation Program here at the Audie Murphy Center in VA. 
and uh, Jane will speak to the holistic aspects and the longitudinal aspects of caring for the wounded warrior and his or her family. So to begin to tee us off, I'd like to invite uh, Christian up to the stage um, and we'll get this, this uh, aircraft on takeoff. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Good morning, welcome and thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I have roughly about 10 minutes and I'll be completely honest, it's very challenging for me to say anything in 10 minutes. Um, it looks like a few people decided to sleep in but I think we'll do just fine uh, without them. As uh, Dr. Hepburn was saying, uh, I was injured uh, June 3rd, 2005. Uh, I grew up in a very rural part of Oregon, came from a very poor family, uh, and I, I knew that I needed to do something uh, with my life. I couldn't just stay in this small town and, and, and do what these other people were doing. I needed to, to do something, and so I decided uh, in, in order for me to go to college, somebody was going to have to pay for it. So uh, I was approached at a, at a high school event by a, a National Guard recruiter. Of course, I didn't know anything about the armed forces. Uh, so I thought, what the heck, we'll give it a try. And uh, at the age of 17, my, my parents uh, co-signed for me to, uh, to join the Guard. And uh, between my junior and senior year in high school, uh, I went to basic training. Um, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit it was pretty scary for a scrawny 17-year-old kid uh, and quite different from everything I was used to. Fast forward to uh, 2004, uh, our unit was deployed to uh, uh, Iraq and uh, of course during my time there uh, it, was, it was difficult. Uh, there was a, uh, an uprising. Uh, I, the Arab Spring and other things that were that were happening made it very uh, challenging to get from point A to point B. Um, of course, there were there were uh, isolated firefights throughout the area of Kirkuk, uh, but but the the primary concern for guys like me on the battlefield and on the ground was the infamous IED, the improvised explosive device. Now, there's a difference. Uh, between a firefight and an IED. At least in a firefight, you have the option of, of getting down and crawling somewhere. When the IED hits, it's, uh, you're just completely hopeless and helpless. Um, so the morning of June 3rd, 2005, um, we were out on a, uh, on a route clearance mission. It was something that we didn't normally do, uh, but that morning we were tasked with this particular uh, mission. And uh, as we got to our objective, uh, that's when the first IED detonated. And uh, I'd been through three previous IED explosions. Now, on the morning of June 3rd, my driver, uh, we were in a big hurry to get out here, and my driver forgot his uh, night vision goggles, or rather, excuse me, the, the bracket that connects the night vision goggles to the helmet. So I hopped in the driver's seat. Uh, when the lieutenant's vehicle was hit in front of us, of course, uh, you know, we wanted to be careful about everybody rushing up there because the insurgency would then detonate a secondary device. Uh, but when we could hear them screaming, uh, that's when I made the decision that uh, we needed to go up and help. So I, of course, hit the gas pedal, and uh, right here is the only portion of the Humvee uh, where the armor was uh, compromised. And of course, my legs were, were right under there. Um, I was trapped inside that vehicle for about 90 minutes, and uh, it was one of the most horrific physical experiences of my life. Um, the pain was indescribable. Um, I was losing a lot of blood. Uh, I was confused. Uh, I thought and believed, rightfully so, that, that I had a few minutes left here, and I told my friends and buddies, you know, tell my wife I love her and that I'm sorry. Um, 90 minutes later, we finally got a helicopter inbound um, and they were able to get me to Balad. I remember getting on that helicopter and just begging for some kind of pain relief, uh, which they gave to me. But I remember coming down into Balad and landing and seeing the dust kick up and uh, uh, of course they, they, they threw me on this gurney with wheels and ran me into this tent and I can remember people standing over me, um, 
asking questions and poking and prodding and pulling clothing off. And uh, the only way I can describe that experience was like watching the television on mute. Uh, it was just a very, a very strange, strange experience. Uh, several days later, I came out of a, a medically induced coma uh, and I awoke in Germany. Uh, I'll never forget this guy's name. His name was Dr. Edward Putnam. And uh, I, was, I was coming to, and he, and he put his, his arm on my shoulder, and he said, uh, I don't know what he called me, Christian or Sergeant or whatever, but he said, uh, we, we had to amputate your legs to, to save your life. And uh, I, I just broke. I broke down. I felt my heart sink. Uh, I was scared. I didn't know what I was going to do. My wife and I were married two months, two months before this injury. And I was afraid that uh, she couldn't love me anymore. And I, I didn't blame her. Uh, a couple hours later, somebody handed me a telephone. And they said, we've got your wife on the phone. And I had the chance to ask her. I said, uh, you know, did, did they tell you what happened? And she said, yes. And uh, I said, can you, can you still love me? And she said, yes. So I knew right then and there, no matter what happened, at least we were going to be able to be together and move forward through this together. Uh, I became stabilized in Germany, several surgeries, several washouts. I know that I had a total of about 15 surgeries. Uh, from uh, Germany, I went to Walter Reed in Washington, D.C., and uh, they were having a, a very difficult time in June of 2005. Um, it, I, I don't know if it was just too many injured service members or what was going on, but they gave us the option, since we were from the West Coast in Oregon, that we could transfer to Brook Army Medical Center here in San Antonio, Texas. So we took that, that option and came down here and uh, really had an incredible, incredible experience. Meeting some of the uh, surgeons, uh, Dr. Granville, Colonel Granville was one of them. Uh, hilarious guy, I loved this guy, I, I, I trusted him. Um, and, and, and to meet these people and know that they were doing their best for me so that I could get back on my feet, so to speak, uh, was, was really uh, rewarding. From there, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Center for Intrepid. I think Mr. Ferguson's going to speak more to that. But uh, prior to the Center for the Intrepid uh, being built, we were at this downstairs uh, laboratory at Brook Army Medical Center, a very small, small place. And there was guys in, and, and, and the prosthetics people were right there. We were kind of right in the middle of their, of their workspace. But it was fun and neat to see these guys work. Um, and, and watch your prosthesis being developed. Of course, that's changed now. But uh, it, it was pretty neat at the time. And uh, I can remember uh, the first time <clears throat> that I got up on my, on my prosthetic legs. Prior to that, I had been put on this uh, device called the, the tilt table. Um, of course, your limbs are, are very swollen. They're sore. Uh, the, uh, your residual limbs are, are sensitive. Uh, and so for the first time, uh, they, they lay you down horizontally on this table. I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with this, so I apologize if it's repetitive. And they, they lay you on this table, they put your prosthesis on, and then they slowly, slowly kind of tilt you up so that you can feel what it's like to put weight uh, on your legs. And I can remember just uh, wincing in pain. It was a very foreign uh, feeling to me. Uh, almost, uh, because it had been several months, it was almost like I was 10 feet tall. I'd been in a wheelchair, I'd been in a hospital bed, and it was really quite exhilarating to stand up for the first time in, in several months. Um, now, I spent a total of three years uh, within the, well, I, let me back up, about two years in the Brook Army Medical Center system and then uh, I was medically retired from the Army. And from there, I uh, transitioned to the Veterans Administration. And this was, of course, uh, somewhat scary to me because I'd heard the, the horror stories from the veterans that, uh, that preceded us. And so I was, I was fairly reluctant to get involved in, in the VA system. 
That being said, of course, you had to go down and you had to get rated for your percentage of, of disability and compensation and pension and all that stuff. So I got a little bit familiarized with the clinic here in San Antonio and uh, went to go few, uh, uh, see a few outpatient doctors. But other than that, I, I, I always kept my prosthetics care at the Center for the Intrepid. Then we moved to, to Oregon State, where we're from. Again, I was quite reluctant to get into the VA. However, I did go to, to some appointments. But uh, uh, the VA had this program, I think they still have it, which, which I used often. The VA would pay a civilian prosthetics provider to take care of uh, someone like me. And it, uh, it was nice because the process was, was streamlined. I didn't have to, uh, to, to schedule and coordinate through the VA. Uh, which at the time was a giant bureaucracy and, and quite intimidating for somebody that uh, doesn't want to talk on the phone to begin with. So I had this option of this uh, care through civilian providers, and I used that. About two months ago, my wife and I moved back down here to San Antonio from Oregon, and I've been getting prosthetics care at the, uh, at the Center for the Intrepid. And Mr. Ferguson over here is my uh, prosthetist. He's an excellent prosthetist and uh, someone that I would call uh, a good friend. But um, my time's about up here. But here's this slide, if you could put it up, Steve, of my, my little boy. This is on the Oregon coast. And uh, it's very hard for me to explain the, the difficulties of walking with two prosthetic uh, legs on sand. Now, wet sand is, is OK, but you get out on the dry sand, and uh, it makes it very difficult to, to ambulate. And uh, of course, for years, I had resisted. Uh, I didn't really want to go to the beach. And I was somewhat depressed about not being able to take my shoes off and feel the, the sand in my toes. But as I had a young and growing family, um, it was important that I learn how to you know, push through these things so that our children and, uh, could grow up in a home where they weren't you know, with a dad that just wouldn't do anything. So uh, we, as often as we can, we, we get outside with them and, and take them places like this. And, and uh, of course, it's a challenge for me, but I think it's, uh, it's a challenge worth taking so that our uh, children can see their father at least trying to do something uh, for them. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my wife, Melissa. Um, she can speak to uh, this slide. But again, thank you for, uh, for being willing to listen uh, to me. And uh, here's my wife, Melissa. Okay. Hello. So this is my first time speaking in 11 years um, and telling my story. So he's very um, well-versed, and I'm um, like a deer in the headlights right now. So, um, <clears throat> uh, Christian and I have been friends since we were 10. Uh, we met in fifth grade, and we were best friends throughout, uh, all the way through high school. Um, I went off to college, and he went off uh, to college separate places. Um, and right before he deployed, I came down to see him, and he kind of uh, asked me if I'd like to go uh, to the East Coast. He thought for sure he was going to die. He wanted to have a great time before, before that happened. So we went, uh, he flew me out, and we went um, up to the East Coast, and we fell in love. And that was about a week. So we were together uh, holding hands as a couple for about five days, and then he de deployed. Um, between November and March, we started talking about getting married, and our family thought we were crazy. Uh, but we just knew that we, this is what we wanted to do. Um, so in March, he flew back on his two-week R&R, and we eloped in Las Vegas, which is what this picture is. And I never thought that I would elope, but I did. And we, we, he promised me we'd have a big wedding a year later when he got back. So uh, we were planning that. Um, I was working at home, kind of looking for a place to live while he was uh, for us to live in when he got back. Um, June 3rd, 2005, I um, got a knock at the door. Um, another wife was there, and she told me, somebody's trying to get a hold of you. I had no idea how the military worked. I don't have, I, I didn't know what orders were. I didn't know 
just the night before I had been eating with one of the other wives and she said, if somebody comes to your door in BDUs, that's okay, that just means he's hurt. If they come in their class A, that's a different story. So I didn't think, you know, a wife, I thought, oh, well, something, maybe he just needs to talk on the phone. Um, well, that wasn't the case. They told me that he had two broken legs and that a toe had been amputated. And I was so sad for that little toe. Um, and I was really naive. I didn't realize. My dad was alongside me the whole time, and he knew, he told me later, he knew you don't just really get two broken legs in a war zone. Um, but I just thought it'll be okay. Um, through the day, we got more updates. Um, his arm had been severely injured also. Um, and probably, I don't know, eight hours later, we got a call that said they had amputated his legs. Um, he goes by his middle name, Christian. His first name's Johan. So when they called me and told me, um, we're calling about your husband, I said, no, that's not my husband. He's, you have it wrong. He actually goes, and they said no, and they, they gave me a social security number, and I said, okay. Um, and that was, from that point on, I kind of just went into numb mode. I always tell people now that any, anyone that's in a traumatic situation, whether it's having a husband that's injured or having a child that's missing, or you, you just don't judge them during a time of trauma. You, I deal with it differently than other people, and I just became... I just did what I had to do. And my emotions were, were there, but they were not at the forefront. My thoughts were for him. Um, so we kind of played a waiting game. We didn't know what we were supposed to do. Um, we heard that he was in, gonna be in Germany. We didn't know if we needed to go to Germany or Walter Reed or, um, we had to wait for orders. And I didn't like that idea because I wanted to, wanted to be doing something. I wanted to be where he was. Um, and the next morning, I got a call at about 6 o'clock in the morning, and it was him. And I remember everybody saying, you have to, the first time you talk to him, you have to be really strong. You have to sound a certain way. You have to tell him, you know, make sure he knows that. And so there's a lot of pressure on me to, to just get it just right. Um, so I did a lot of praying and just for, praying for strength and praying for the right words. So um, when he called, I, he said, did they tell you? And I said, yep, they told me. And he said, well, we, can you still love me? And I said, yep, we're going to do this together, and you don't have to worry. Um, I will be there for, for you through it all. So so after that, he said, OK. and. Um, I decided that we were going to fly without orders, um, my dad and I. So we flew to Walter Reed, and we were there. And again, it was the first time you see him, make sure, maybe you should put some perfume on so he knows it's you, because he couldn't see um, at the time. So um, we waited, and I was so worried about when I would first see him. We stayed the night, and they finally came in at about 2 o'clock in the morning and said, you can go in and see him now. So we prayed, and um, I was so worried about what I was going to say, and I didn't want to look at his legs. Do I look at his legs? Do I say anything about it? What do I do? And I walked into the room, and he said, look at you. I will never forget. And there was a, a nurse in there, and he said, this is my, do you see my wife? Look how beautiful she is. And I just, that was it. I didn't have to, it was, there was no, he made it so comfortable, and he was always that way in the hospital um, with nurses and doctors. He was always gracious and kind. And um, so from Walter Reed, uh, we were there for five days, and then we went to uh, BMC. Um, I was, we're from a really small town, and I was really, uh, Washington, D.C. was just driving to Walter Reed. I was terrified. Um, so... You know, you hear a lot of great things about Texas, so we thought, well, it's closer to home, so we'll go there. Um, so we got here uh, June 11th, 2005, and that began his um, just surgery after surgery. A um, lot of hope that he was going to get to walk soon, he was going to get to stand up, that he could go outside, and then he'd have an infection. And he'd be on contact precautions, and we'd be in gowns, and it took a long time. It took probably 
two months before he got up and walking. And um, the care we received was amazing. We, um, we saw Mr. Ferguson from the beginning, and he has become a good friend of ours. Um, and um, let me see. So anyway, for the next two years, I was kind of in caregiving mode. Um, we did physical therapy twice a day. Um, I, that was my job, and that was a, a job that I was proud of having and that I would do over again. Um, but definitely, it's, um, it's difficult for the families. Uh, we were fortunate that we didn't have kids at the time, but we saw a lot of people that did. And, um, you know, this is the burn center here, and uh, I just, I felt for the, for the women that had to explain to their kids that this was their dad laying in bed that was not recognizable. Um, so we are very fortunate in that sense, but I feel like uh, there might have been, could have been a little bit of um, just better resources for the wives um, in taking care and, and dealing with that. And I realized that was in the beginning of, of things, so I'm sure it's probably gotten better since then. Um, let me see. So I'm a pretty soft-spoken person, and I have always really not liked conflict. Uh, but when, you're hospital, when your husband's laying in a bed and something goes wrong, you quickly learn that you are the only advocate. So I quickly began to speak up and put my foot down, and I, it was so uncomfortable for me, but I just, um, it was just me and him. So I had to quickly um, become kind of a different person. And after about four years, I've, I've talked to other wives who have said the same thing. Um, it was my time to kind of break down. And I dealt with depression and anxiety. Um, and I don't have that in my family. I've never, I've actually kind of honestly always thought it was a joke. I didn't really think it was just be happy. And, but it's not. And when you go th through something traumatic, uh, your time comes. It just, you know, when that happens is just uh, unique to each person. But um, I have suffered from that. Uh, and several other women said when the dust kind of settles and everything is taken care of, it's your time to kind of start looking at yourself and figuring out what you need to do. So we have both dealt with that. Um, we've dealt with um, PTSD. I mean, everything that I'm going to talk about, Christians knows. So um, we've dealt with suicidal thoughts and, and statements uh, where I have not quite known what to do. Um, there's, a, there's a really fine line between trying to help your husband maintain his dignity and trying to keep him safe. And, um, you know, these are strong young men that are getting hurt. And they want to have it all together, and they do have it all together, and then something like this happens, and it's just really difficult. They want to be independent. They don't want to depend on any, anyone. Um, so as a wife, it's, it's really been a struggle. Uh, I know the suicide, suicide among veterans is very real, and I, I take it very seriously. Um, sometimes even when he doesn't think it's serious, I do, and I don't. So <clears throat> that's been difficult just because uh, it's not really anything people want to talk about. You don't think it can happen to you, but it, it is real. And it, um, getting up every day and having to put on your legs and have, being in pain um, will take a toll on you. And I've seen that take a toll on him. And it's a very helpless feeling um, when it's been 11 years, but um, just to hear someone say that they're hurting um, and not really being able to do anything about it. Um, I have a medical background. I have a degree in biology, and I, I did a lot of uh, it was sports medicine. So I was able to help him with a lot of different things when he was in pain. Or, um, but there's a lot of things, emotional things, that I can't uh, begin to pretend like I know how to help with. Um, so I'm very thankful uh, to the doctors and to the VA and um, just to the to programs that are available for veterans um, that are can be he can take advantage of. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
How am I doing on time? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. So now that we have kids, um, we have an eight-year-old boy um, who was recently diagnosed with Asperger's, and we have a five-year-old little girl. And in Oregon, growing up, uh, it's just not really military friendly. There's not a base. Um, we really felt like uh, pretty isolated. I felt like I felt like it's important for our kids to see other uh, men and women who are like their dad, and to uh, see Christian be appreciated and thanked and recognized for what he does every day. Uh, and that just didn't really happen a whole lot in Oregon. Uh, and I, just, I feel like that's important. I feel like our kids need to know um, what he has sacrificed and what other people have sacrificed. Uh, so we made a decision to move down here, um, mostly for our son, but also um, it was my hope that uh, our kids you know, could grow up in a community that was uh, very grateful uh, to all men and women who have served. Uh, we went to a pool party a couple of weeks, well, a couple months ago, and every person there, every man that was there was an amputee, and that had never happened. Our kids had never even seen another amputee in Oregon, and it was just normal. They just, hey, you're like my dad, and I was so thankful just, just to have, I think it's really important. There's a lot of people that are uh, you know, this is Military City USA. Um, it's wonderful, but there's a lot of uh, outlying places where there's just those lone, uh, injured service members that are um, really isolated and need to be reached out to, um, both for themselves and for their families. Um, let's see. So I think the last thing, I guess, um, is just that it's, it's been a difficult 11 years, but there have been a lot of wonderful opportunities for us. Um, we've met a lot of wonderful people. Uh, we've met a lot of people who just have genuinely good, helpful hearts, um, who love the military, who love our veterans. Um, so I think that, you know, I think we're, we're seasoned now. I meet a lot of younger uh, men and women who have just begun their journey uh, with their injuries. Um, and I think it's really important uh, to get others, uh, other wi wives together, um, to get the men together. It's so healing and to know that you're not alone, that you're not, what you're dealing with is not just you. There's other people that are dealing with the same things. Um, I think that's really healing and I think that's been... Um, very helpful. I'm, I'm glad to see that that's still happening. Um, and I think, I think that's all. I could go on for a long time, I think, but um, thank you for listening to me and for having me. And I'll turn it over to someone else now. I say done. All right. Thank you, Christian and Melissa, and uh, thank you for your courage, both of you, and continued courage, and also uh, making this fabric here in San Antonio even stronger by your presence. But we're going to get back to that with some Q&A in a minute. But I do want to segue now to Dr. Davis, uh, really a renowned surgeon, researcher, and clinician. And Mike, over to you. Thanks. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd first like to start by uh, thanking you, both of you, for your service and your courage in getting up and telling your story, uh, I think which is so important. You really are representative of you know, why so many of us are eager to go to work every day uh, to enable us to get the best outcomes for service members who have suffered devastating injuries, so thank you. What I wanted to talk about this morning is, is a background of how we in the DOD trauma 
uh, research community have been and are focused on innovative ways to get, really get the best outcomes e from everywhere from the point of injury through reconstruction and full rehabilitation. So shortly after uh, World War I, the Mayo brothers uh, were attributed the quote, the only victor in war is medicine. And this is really no more true than over the past 15 years of combat through OIF, OEF. Um, we've really made great strides in uh, advancing critical care, rapid evacuation times, body armor, all of which go into our ability to save lives um, and to preserve, uh, to preserve lives. Go back to the slides. <laughs> so this is a uh, figure that depicted that was depicted on the cover of a Journal of Trauma Supplement recently, and I'm sure most of you have, have probably had a chance to see this, but uh, it's worth looking at again because it's really a tribute to the impact of of military trauma care and research. Uh, what you can see depicted here is. Over the past 10 years, um, even though, as this tracing shows, the injury severity score has steadily risen, um, and that's really secondary to the mode of warfare of, of our combatants, uh, IED-based warfare, um, despite that rise, we have seen a drop in the case fatality rate to an all-time low of, of 8%, never before seen in, in any previous conflict. And again, this is a tribute to, to not only the, the care that uh, is, is given in theater, but also the research that goes into innovative ways to, to save lives and care for these individuals. One thing that uh, Dr. Hepburn wanted me to touch on was uh, the advances in uh, the joint theater trauma system and how these rapid evacuation times uh, and the, the, the really efficiency of the system has contributed to, uh, to saving lives that in previous conflicts may have been lost. It really starts at level one. Uh, this is at the point of injury, and this is the domain of the, the combat medic um, who, who really uh, are able to, to administer some fairly sophisticated uh, care, especially with regard to compressible hemorrhage. So it's fairly rare in, in recent conflicts that someone that is exposed to an IED and sustains significant extremity injury, it's fairly rare for those individuals to succumb to their injuries in the field. Fairly rapidly, really within, certainly within an hour and, and most commonly within 30 to 45 minutes, uh, depending on the, uh, the, the environment of the, the injury, um, these individuals are able to be evacuated to a level two, system, level two uh, center where you have general surgery support and orthopedic support. And these are termed forward surgical teams, often in forward operating bases. Um, and these, the, the purpose of level two is to, to do damage control surgery, um, whether it's vascular orthopedic, um, if it's thoracic injury, uh, to do life-saving thoracic surgery or uh, damage control abdominal surgery. Again, in fairly short order, usually within three hours, individuals are able to be evacuated to a level three center, which in essence is really equivalent, in my experience, to a level one trauma center here in the U.S. And, and to be honest, on occasion, uh, there is greater capability at some of these level three centers in theater. And these are represented by Bagram and Kandahar in Operation Enduring Freedom. Usually within you know, a day uh, to three days, the patient is stabilized well enough at the level three center then to be evacuated uh, by a, a combat or a, uh, a CCAT team, which is a, essentially a mobile ICU team. Um, and this was represented by uh, evacuation to Landstuhl, Germany. And here the level three care 
uh, really the level one trauma center type care is continued until they're able to be evacuated uh, to the United States, either to Walter Reed or to uh, or SAMC here in San Antonio. So that system, um, having been deployed, I attribute probably the, the biggest life-saving advances to. We have certainly made life-saving advances in critical care um, and in, in protecting the vital organs through advanced body armor. But this rapid evacuation system, I think, has really created uh, a milieu to, to enable us to get the best outcomes for our service members, especially early on. Uh, with a pivot towards the Pacific, uh, this paradigm will certainly change. Um, the evacuation times will change, um, and the strategies for how the care is administered, um, and the research that goes into allowing us to, to um, preserve life and limb for an extended period of time in a far forward environment will definitely have to advance. So these are some other, you can see some other advances that uh, have enabled us to save lives. Depicted here on the left is a, uh, a modern OEF mounted vehicle uh, called, turned an MRAP, a mine resistant ambush protected vehicle. Um, and this is designed to, to sustain IED blasts from below and still protect the occupants. Um, occasionally, these occupants do suffer calcaneal fractures or spine fractures, but on re very rare occasion ever succumb to their injuries from an IED blast while mounted. But you can see a dismounted service member, although they have very good body armor, typically have completely exposed upper and lower extremities. So if they're in anywhere in proximity to an IED blast, these structures are very susceptible to devastating injury. So not only, so, so we've made really incredible advances in saving lives, and there's still more to do. Uh, we, we certainly need to maintain our ability to keep that case fatality rate at an all-time low, um, but we need to do a lot more also on the reconstructive and rehabilitative side. Um, I think that's where we really can make some incredible advances. Um, to DOD's great credit, there have been multiple efforts to fund research that allows us to, to create innovative ways to, to optimize reconstructive outcomes, incorporate regenerative medicine, and, uh, and really allow uh, for advanced prosthetic development. So of these, uh, most of us are aware of the, the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine, which has been roughly about a $300 million um, DOD venture in being able to uh, advance regenerative medicine and what, what I term restorative medicine, which really includes advances in reconstructive surgery alongside advances in regenerative medicine, again, to get the best outcomes. There are congressionally directed medical research programs which fund everything from point of injury care through final rehabilitation. Each of the services has their own mechanism for funding this research. There's the U.S. Army uh, Medical Research and Materiel Command. There's the United States Air Force Medical Service. And there's the Office of Naval Research, all of which have their own funding lines to fund this type of research. So with that, I'll conclude. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hepburn, for allowing me to participate in this panel, and I'm certainly open for any questions afterwards. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Well done. Thank you very much. All right, we'll now transition over to Mr. John Ferguson from the Center for the Intrepid and speak to that phase of the journey back here in the amputee care. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> uh, you know, Chris and I were both trying to figure out how we're going to uh, talk in as few as 10 minutes. Uh, uh, some of us uh, seem to like podiums more than others, but uh, uh, hats off for Melissa for pulling that off. <laughs> it's impressive. It's okay. So this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, I have it up on my wall because of the story behind it. When uh, uh, Christian had told the president, he said, he was early in his rehab, I think he was barely walking at the time. I'm going to probably botch it, but I'll give my version. It could be completely wrong, but um, it's probably better anyway. But uh, he, he told the president, said, you know, I, I, I want to run with you. 
And, uh, you know, the president unknowingly said, yeah, no problem. You get to that point, you're in. Well, Christian took that to heart. And several months later, uh, this was happening. And uh, uh, it, it was pretty funny because uh, uh, that was a driver for him. The president took it seriously, at least when it came time when Christian made the call to the staffer that was supposed to handle this and say, well, uh, I'm ready to run now and let the president know what date he'd like me up there. That's as close as I can get to the story. But it, he's looking at me like, you got it all wrong. But it was something like that. But the point was, uh, uh, we were getting uh, Christian ready uh, a day or two before, and of course, in prosthetics, what you learn after a while is we, we just, we kind of do everything at the last minute because we're always trying to get something better. I'll wake up and think, doggone it, I should have done that. Oh, I should have done this. We could do that. And, and uh, so naturally, a night or two before, we were trying to get the prosthetics tuned up. And uh, uh, I don't know uh, if you're familiar enough with limbs, but uh, on his above the knee side, and this, I got Christian's permission to talk about this, at least to, to some extent. So... We kind of had to have a, a, a rainy day set and a clear weather set, if you remember that, because he didn't want to get out there and fall all over the president. You know, trip and fall, I thought, oh my gosh, who made those legs? It wasn't me, it was somebody else. But for him, uh, I, and I watched that, and now Christian got kind of a hard time. I didn't show him one of the pictures that he doesn't like because the therapist got all over him because this very famous picture went national and he didn't have his arm position right when he was running. <laughs> now, only we would know that, and him. He says, oh, I can't believe, I can't believe they put that one up like that. But, you know, so when we look at advances in limb prosthetics, it's, it's, it's much less about the advance in the, uh, in the prosthetic design. I mean, that's what I do. I live and breathe it, really. Uh, it, it's really about the person, who, the, the end user. And I consider myself pretty close to the end user of the research efforts that the, the Department of Defense and, the, and the, the federal system in general has put toward prosthetics in this decade. I have virtually never been told no. Now, that, that, that may be shocking in terms of, of uh, uh, the, the current climate, but people are still taking it very seriously about, about allowing someone like myself to be able to fully service someone like Christian who, who needs help and doesn't need to be told no. So something came up in the last Olympics about are prosthetics an advantage? Am I faster? Am I better? And uh, if you remember some of that, some of that, oh, the sound, turn the sound off if you would on that, on all of them, because I have no idea what's being said on these. But if you look at that, now he was probably pretty sprintable beforehand, before his amputation. Uh, but the point would be, the prosthetics are not going to make you necessarily faster. That's a bit of a myth. Now, there may come a day, but we're not at that day yet. Um, nothing that we do really produces energy, unlike our our, our skeletal system, which produces incredible amounts of energy for doing athletic events. Prosthetics can, can help someone uh, reach different goals and new goals, but you know, it's not like we're gonna line up for surgeries so we can have prosthetics and get better. We're, we're certainly not anywhere near that. Now, you know, I see head, heads nodding in the audience. Yeah, that's obvious, but you know, it might be obvious in this room, but it's not always obvious to the general public who think this is the greatest thing ever. Wow, that's amazing, it's great, but they don't hear the stories that you just heard. So this comes up a lot, uh, sound off. Um, limb salvage or amputation. Uh, there's been a lot of work and progress made in limb salvage. And for someone like this individual who had bilateral ankle fusions, well, for him, it was a successful surgery, but the outcome wasn't successful. And so if you look at him now, these are specially designed um, uh, braces that were, were developed at Center for the Intrepid over the last 10 years. And you may have heard some about that over the year. I think Dr. Stinner may have mentioned it, had a talk on it last day or two. But this whole idea behind a salvaged limb that's been now maintained, should I keep it, should I not keep it? And uh, uh, in really until the last five, since about 2009, there wasn't a lot of option for someone who wanted to pursue athletics again after they've had limbs salvaged, where they've either had fusions or there's pain after the salvage. And it may be a successful surgical procedure and successful result, but the problems were that some of those individuals would see our, in, our other individuals who had amputations and, and getting back to running, getting back to full life activities that they weren't able to do. And so when you talk about research drivers toward, okay, what we're saying about what can we do in salvage procedures and saving limbs that leaves us with functional results afterwards, 
versus just saying, oh, let's, just, let's just cut bait and do amputation. So we've come up with systems that we're able to offer people now similar levels of activities with severe limb injuries um, using uh, specialized bracing systems. So I always have to talk a little bit about salvage, even if it's in the context of a talk about prosthetic devices and, and amputation. So what has been some of the drivers in the last decade? We talk about uh, uh, war being a driver in prosthetic advancement. It always has. Every conflict you look at through history, uh, that's been the case. And this one was no exception. And so when you look at, at some of what's happening here, one of the first things in my world as active duty, serving the active duty injury, is this idea about return to duty. Now, if you look at that, that little video clip on there, I have no idea if that technique is right or wrong. There's probably people in the audience that could pick that apart. The point would be um, the prosthesis has to handle that person's body weight and a whole bunch more, whatever it is he put on the rack there. Okay, so you have an idea about return to duty. If I want to return to duty of full capability, then we have to help them get to that level with the prosthetic device utilizing it. And I have people deployed all over the world right now, even some in, in elite units, some in ranger units um, uh, that are doing well. But I'll tell you, they have to take literally a trunk of supplies with them because I'm not going, I'm not going with them and they have to be able to self-service what they're doing. So if you run that one on the left now, so for some of the other things that have driven advancement has been people's expectations. If I, have limb ex if I have limb amputation, I have an expectation, not just of walking around, maybe you like boxing. Okay, I'm ringside on these boxing events now. Now, I'm not going to get in the ring with them, but I love helping them get into the ring. And uh, uh, the idea there is that there's a, there's a whole um, uh, association for those boxing with limb loss. And this, this event was happening right here. You look at that and say, what in the world? But this, this event was uh, right here in San Antonio. And so when we talk about these other things, CrossFit, which has really uh, taken the country by storm, um, Tough Mudders, uh, things like this, uh, Spartan races, all these various races where it's very, very high activity and it's very demanding on able body, much less someone with prosthetic devices. But those folks who are athletes, they want to do those same things. It's very unfair for me to ask someone when I'm seeing them, okay, what do you want to do? Well, that, 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 that's a ridiculous question. It took me a while to understand that. Uh, uh, because what they want to do is everything. I want to do everything else. So why do you want to ask me a question like that? I want to do everything. I don't want limits put upon me. And once I finally learn that, that the people will find their own limits or they'll direct themselves to places they can excel, not unlike anybody else. Okay, I'm not going to go out and pursue activities that I know I'm not going to be successful at. I'm going to go after the things that I really like and that I have a good chance of being good at. So again, my goal is trying to chase the prosthetic advancements, apply them to the individual situation. But I'll tell you, it's not the prosthesis that makes somebody go fast. It's the person that's trained up properly, has had the right therapies, the right interventions, the right medicine um, uh, or me medication control, uh, the whole life picture. My goal is not necessarily to get someone back to duty unless that's their goal. My goal is to get someone back on their ATV. My goal is to open them up to things they haven't done before. So uh, we look at here, returning to life after amputation. It's not about how great the prosthesis is because, you know, they're really not that great. They are great in the sense of we've made incredible advancements, but no one here is going to volunteer to get one. It's, it's not that way. So we're looking at other things about returning, returning back to life, returning back to not being stared at in the grocery store, returning back to um, going for a run in this evening because I feel like it tonight. And you look at here, this, is re, this, is a, she has a, this young lady has a right above the knee amputation. And, and she, well, what does she want to return back to? She has jump status. She has full jump status. She doesn't jump tandems. She doesn't jump buddy. She jumps. And so she needed to get back to jumping. And for her and for anyone else with amputation, it's about finding your new body symmetry. It's about finding your balance now, which is very, very different than what you're used to and accustomed to. Um, with one limb, that, that's one circumstance. With two limbs, lower, lower, that's another circumstance. But we've had a lot of individuals in the back around the surge when we started a lot of dismounted, uh, dismounted activity. A, a lot of the earlier aspect of the conflict was mounted, which means they were in vehicles and blasts were floor up. Uh, but the dismount now, when folks are getting um, on the ground and stepping on mines and IEDs and such, uh, the injuries got really, really severe. We have a lot of folks with triple amputation. You think, okay, how do I help that individual get back 
uh, uh, to a quality of life that, that's acceptable to them. And so my encouragement there is, is we have to continue to push uh, what we're talking about with the research aspect, but not just, not just the hard science, it's the getting back to life aspect, which I think we'll, we'll hear from our next speaker a little bit more about that, about how the Veterans Administration is addressing that very issue. Because really, in, in, in my world, where I, uh, have a, a, I have funding behind me, I have a state-of-the-art facility, I have a large staff, okay? And I have support all the way from the top down. And most of my clientele are 20, 30-somethings that were highly active before their injuries. You know what, if I don't show good outcomes, there's a serious problem. If all of your clientele were in their 20s and traumatic, then, then you would all have better practices, right? And so my peers get on me pretty hard about, yeah, you really need to be getting guys back way out of the box about activity because you've got the perfect world. And suddenly in the last 10 years, my world has developed into a world of who I think my peers are 20 and 30. They remind me I'm not their peer. But I start thinking like I'm one of them. I sort of, oh, I'm not. I'm here to take care of them. These guys are way above my activity level, even, even with, with limb loss. So when I go to the track to run with the guys, um, I'll bring up the rear guys. I got the back. I want to make sure all the legs are doing OK, right? So, but when you talk about what you want to do, it, it, my, my emphasis here is not to just look at the prosthetic device. We've made incredible advancements. I could, I could speak for two or three hours on the technological advances, but I think what we're talking about here is more about the end user and finding what helps somebody get back to life. It may be a very low technology prosthesis. It may be the highest tech ever, or it may frankly be a closet full of them. And, and no one in here has one pair of shoes for all their activities. So my individual's limb loss probably shouldn't have one prosthesis to go do, to go to the beach like you saw, um, to skydive like you saw. So we have to open up our minds a little bit about what we're going to provide for people. And there are powered joints. There are powered prosthetics. There's osseous integration coming where it's a direct skeletal attachment that's been recently approved and is starting in Utah already. I'm all for all of it, and I want all of it, but my direct world is the end user, what you see on the stage today. Thank you. That's all. Oops. Thanks, John. Very well done. Thank you. All right, we'll now transition to that holistic piece of the care journey and with Dr. Halamai from the Audie Murphy VA. And I'm sure uh, Jane will touch on the family dimension as well as the uh, individual wounded warrior. Thanks, Jane. All right, good morning, everyone. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for asking me to be part of this panel today. And I've really enjoyed getting to know the baggies this morning. And I still look forward to working with them in the future. We've not had a lot of uh, contact with them up to this point. But um, I think uh, we'll be good friends moving forward. So. Um, but really my objective today, so, so I am actually with the Polytrauma Center here in San Antonio, um, and I've actually been with the center since the very beginning. So um, I was telling everybody this morning, I may not be the smartest person in the world, but I've been around the longest, and I know all their secrets, and so they can't get rid of me at this point. Um, but anyway, my real objective today, though, is to really, um, really show you guys the commitment that the VA does have to uh, treating uh, service members, veterans, and their families uh, long term using a holistic and integrated approach. So although um, the polytrauma system of care wasn't necessarily available for um, Mr. Baggy early on, I'm really hoping that um, with getting him involved um, at this point, he'll be really proud of what we've accomplished over uh, the last several years. Uh, so the, the first slide that I have here is really just a representation of what a transition through the system of care should look like all the way from, uh, from the beginning, what Dr. Davies was talking about, this medical and uh, surgical care for those acute injuries. Um, the polytrauma system of care really comes into play with this rehabilitation level. And we've really made a lot of progress over the last several years. So um, as you are um, probably all very well aware that we've made a, a lot of gains. So in the beginning, um, many, many years ago, the VA was tasked with creating this system of care that would be able to care for service members and their families after some of these very severe injuries. So we literally started off with four lead TBI centers, um, which were converted into the first four polytrauma rehabilitation centers. Um, over the last several years, that's actually grown into five. So San Antonio was the fifth. 
Um, we've added on five uh, transitional programs, which we'll talk a little bit more about here uh, with community reintegration, and over 140 outpatient clinics and point of contact sites. So, um, so pretty amazing. Um, when we're talking about this, um, this uh, rehabilitation level, however, um, you know, we've actually treated over 1,400 patients in the actual acute uh, rehabilitation centers up to this point. So, so some amazing, uh, amazing numbers have been seen. Uh, one of our programs that I feel is very unique to the polytrauma system of care is this emerging consciousness program. So these are really, this is a program set up at all the five polytrauma sites for those individuals with very severe traumatic brain injury that are still in what we would call a disorder of consciousness state. So vegetative state, minimally conscious state. And we're really able to work with them and their families to um, work on getting them to emerge uh, from this state and hopefully be able to transition them more into a regular rehabilitation program. Um, so very unique. Um, after this, um, this rehabilitation phase, um, community reintegration is really the next level of care. And in my opinion, this is really one of the most important steps. Um, acute rehab has been along, around for a very, very long time, but what do we do after that? How do we get these people back to, to life, like, like uh, Mr. Ferguson was talking about, getting them back to work, school, um, back to duty. Um, so, so very important. And so this is where the polytrauma transitional rehabilitation programs uh, were implemented. So these are residential programs where uh, people that have completed their acute re rehabilitation can actually come and stay for a period of time. And we really address um, very individualized goals uh, for them to get them back out into the community. Um, and since 2011, um, we have actually treated over 722 uh, patients so far. Um, our outpatient clinics also fall underneath this community reintegration level as well. Um, so our polytrauma network sites and, and other um, outpatient clinics um, are responsible for um, uh, performing those comprehensive TBI evaluations that many of you are probably familiar with. And so um, the latest numbers so far have shown that since um, the initiation of the screening tool, we have um, actually screened almost a million um, a million service members and veterans up to this point. Um, and of those, at least 180,000 of them um, have received a comprehensive TBI evaluation. So very, very high numbers and a very good opportunity for us to actually intervene at a level where we can provide them some additional services and really address some of their goals um, to returning uh, to the community. Um, and as you can see, the next level of care is just this more of this lifetime support role. Um, regardless of what level that is, whether that's in the home with family, whether that's work, school, um, other types of skilled nursing, um, but the VA uh, polytrauma system of care is there to support them through that as well. The bottom of the slide is really just to um, emphasize how important some of these other um, areas are, such as case management, supporting the family, um, uh, benefits information, medical information, and that that process does start early on and continues throughout um, their entire uh, transition. So I did just want to talk a little bit about integrated um, approaches to treatment in rehabilitation. Um, so this slide is very general for the most part, and it can really pertain to any one of our programs, whether they're inpatient or outpatient. You know, I tr think traditionally when we thought of rehab, we thought a lot of, you know, the brain injury, um, the musculoskeletal injuries, the amputations. Um, and as we all know, it is far more complex than that. And actually, just as complex as some of the injuries are that we actually see that the care that goes into the rehabilitation um, can be equally as complex. You know, as we know, we're, we're really trying to um, tackle some of the mental health issues um, pretty much even up on the unit. Um, sometimes we're actually working on uh, post-traumatic stress disorder from the very beginning, which is very important. Um, blind rehabilitation, that is, um, I think, one of the areas where the VA has really been able to excel. Um, so many times, even with the mild traumatic brain injuries, we actually have some of these visual deficits that you would never actually really notice, because acuity-wise, they look very normal. Um, however, when they're starting to read their books for school, um, they were noticing problems um, and or they're fatiguing very quickly. Um, so our, our programs have been very helpful for that. Um, obviously case management, working on audiology issues they might have, um, pain management, collaborating with some of our, um, our partners in our pain clinics has been very important. And obviously working with other, um, other um, agencies and specialties such as the CFI um, has been an important part. And um, probably most importantly though is this slide that I really wanted to show is that the patient and the family are at the center of this whole thing. So this isn't just a treatment team that's sitting around and making up a, a list of what we think that should happen. This is actually the family and the patient being at the center of that, helping to make some of those decisions
decisions and actually guiding things. Um, again, because what was alluded to before is this really is about the wants and desires of that patient and their family. What I think is important might not be um, what they think is important, and so it's really for us to be on, uh, important for us to be on that same page. So um, over the years, what we have found is traditional medicine is still very good. Um, however, we do have to start thinking outside the box an awful lot, and the VA has definitely tried to um, do as good of a job as we can do with embracing that as best we can. And so when we're talking about promoting uh, physical well-being, um, we know one of the things that we've tried to do within the polytrauma system of care is really tackle some of these, um, some of these problems that we've seen uh, many years after injury, including polysubstance abuse, opioid, uh, and including the opioid safety initiative. And so we're really looking um, at a lot of modalities that do not require medical management. Um, some of these are patient-controlled therapies, such as alpha stem and dolphin stem and thermazone, which um, have all been found to be very helpful for us with treating depression, anxiety, sleep, and headaches. Um, other uh, medication reduction interventions, such as Botox for headaches, acupuncture, yoga, chi yoga chiropractic care. Um, really working on some of those lifestyle changes. So wellness programs, really working on how do I exercise now even with some of the injuries that I actually do have? Um, how am I able to get back to doing some of those things that Mr. Ferguson was talking about when my body doesn't want to do the same thing that it used to do? Um, diet, uh, diet education as well as um, focusing on substance abuse is important. Um, we are looking at kind of reconceptualizing the response to trauma. You know, how do we deal with pain at this point? How are we addressing sleep and having very specific programs that look at that? On the flip side, um, of course, when we're looking at a, whole, a holistic approach, um, we still have to approach that emotional well-being as well. Um, and we do that oftentimes through some goal-based intervention with things like health coaching or some of the whole health programs that the VA, VA has implemented. Um, our chaplain services have been very important. Um, they're integrated into all of our different teams, inpatient and outpatient, with the polytrauma system of care. Um, processing trauma, um, so working closely with our polytrauma um, mental health services um, in addition to other mental health services throughout the VA, including the um, PTSD clinic teams. Um, and then ultimately supporting the, the health giver, or caregiver, I'm sorry, making sure that their um, emotional well-being is also being taken care of um, through things like family therapy. That, to, in my opinion, has been one of the most beneficial um, um, treatments that we've been able to provide. Um, there's just so much, um, so much history um, and so, much ongoing, um, so many ongoing issues that really family therapy is one of the best ways for uh, us to help them walk through that. Um, support groups and obviously the caregiver support program that many of you are probably um, very well aware of. And so finally, I did want to actually talk about just kind of those long-term needs going forward. You know, what is the VA doing now, but also what are we going to be able to do to longitudinally care for um, some of these service members and veterans um, in the long run? So um, as we all know, case management is actually incredibly important. And so through our programs like the OAF OIF office, um, the lead coordinator um, uh, program that's actually being rolled out at this time, um, we're doing a much better job of kind of making sure that all aspects of recovery are being managed along that way. Um, Family support obviously is incredibly important. We've talked about that already. The caregiver support program um, is just an amazing um, opportunity that we do have to not only provide monetary um, support for some of our caregivers, but also the medical and, and psychological needs that they might have as well. Um, Working on accommodating homebound, um, homebound care patients. Um, with this very young population, as you can imagine, many more families are wanting their loved ones to return home with them, regardless of what the level of injury was. So we do have many, many, many veterans out in the community right now that are dependent or unable to communicate. Um, how do we support them the best way possible and, and prevent, really, um, readmissions to the hospital? Um, and allow them to, to um, you know, maintain that, um, that important time at home with the family. So using programs such as home-based primary care, uh, veteran-directed care, um, telehealth into the home, um, in addition to some of the grants that the VA can offer for um, home modifications or assisting with building homes or adapting vehicles um, has been important. 
really promoting some of those community-based living. So we really want to um, help our veterans and service members return to the least restrictive environment. And so some of the programs that the VA has at this time are the assisted living pilot program that you might be familiar with. Um, and up to this point, we have actually placed 221 um, service members and veterans in some of these programs over 22 states. And so far, the, um, the outcomes are very positive. We're seeing some good benefit, and it's very much showing a high satisfaction for families and patients. Um, back to this community reintegration thing. Again, I can't emphasize this enough, but um, utilizing these transitional rehabilitation programs that we actually have um, is, um, is very important. And utilizing some of the other programs in addition to that, such as uh, vo vocational rehab. Uh, we do um, integrate our care an awful lot with some of the other programs within the system of care, um, including the PAC teams with primary care. Uh, we have the post-deployment clinics, um, the PTSD clinic teams, um, and then, of course, our amputee system of care and our spinal cord injury center. Um, and we've already talked about promoting wellness and individualized care. Um, we do have a, a, a new... Um, uh, office through the, the VA called the Office for Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation. And that really is um, what, it, what it says. It, it's really this cultural change. How, how are we putting the, the veterans at the center of this and really focusing on what's important to them? Um, and I did just want to mention um, in closing the, the evidence-based care. So uh, we, we very much are trying to utilize this to the best of our abilities, um, using all the clinical practice guidelines that have actually been put forth by the VA and the DOD in dealing with mild traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, and the chronic multi-system illness. Um, and very similar to uh, what Dr. Uh, Davies was talking about, um, really focusing on research. So we do have a lot going on right now within the polytrauma system of care including uh, studies going on regarding the chronic effects of neurotrauma, dealing with post-traumatic headaches, long-term outcomes, especially in vascular injuries, um, and working very, very closely with the TBI model systems. So thank you so much for, for hearing me out. I really do think that the VA has a lot that we're gonna be able to offer going forward right now. Um, and I very, very much appreciate the opportunity to share all that with you. And I very um, much appreciate the support that the VA, the DOD, um, Congress, um, and our secretary have, um, have given us to continue to move forward with this. It's actually a very unique system of care and I really think that it's one that's really second to none out in the community. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'll tell you what, I want to give a shout out right now to one of the key mission partners in what Dr. Halmai was just speaking to, and that's Dr. Uh, Peterson, who's sitting in the audience, and he's leading the charge with collaborators across the United States, and to include Canadian partners uh, in really tackling this tough challenge of PTSD. Alan, if you could just stand up, I think we need to give you a, a round of applause on behalf of the, all the researchers who are working with you. Okay. Now, we have, we have some good time here to have a good uh, cross talk for the next several minutes and I think this is going to be the most valuable part of the journey this morning but um, why don't we open the mics up right now and uh, take any questions while we're waiting for somebody to come to the mics uh, I'd like hi to I've got the mic here or where, 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 where are you off. hi Cam Ritchie here uh, psychiatrist retired army wonderful presentation this morning wonderful panel about a year ago, the Bob Woodruff Foundation put on a talk, a conference called Intimacy Post-Injury, and it was focusing on sexual health after injury. And this was in Washington, D.C., with a lot of folks from Walter Reed, and I'm sure some of the folks in the audience. A wonderful conference, and I kept saying, you know, this is great information. Why aren't we talking about sexual health more? And we should write a book about it. So short thing is, now I'm writing a book about it. Oxford's going to publish it. But one thing I did not hear from anybody here was a, a, a mention of sexual health and all of the different adaptions that can be done and used. And I'm kind of wondering why that wasn't mentioned. Is it still too much of a taboo topic, or is it not important? Uh, because what I've s found talking to young service members and their wives, it's, it's, and husbands, of course, too, is sexual health is tremendously important. And a couple other pieces to that, some of the things like pain and disability interfere with sexual functioning are SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are the antidepressants used for PTSD, have a myriad of sexual side effects. So I'd be interested in hearing the panel's thoughts on that or anybody else in the room. Thank you. Dr. Richard, just so you know, and then I'm going to certainly let the subject matter experts speak, but 
Here in San Antonio, there's over 100 helping agencies uh, for the veteran and his or her family. And uh, in a recent meeting we had uh, at the San Antonio Medical Foundation, there was an individual that spoke to just what you addressed with this meeting in Washington. So it's, it's, one, it's in the job jar here for Team San Antonio um, to address those uh, second and third order effects that you just speak, spoke to regarding sexual health. Um, but very, I'm glad you brought that up. But I certainly want to segue to uh, the Baggy family or the other subject matter experts and maybe uh, Dr. Halmai, you may have some thoughts as well. Yeah. Well, hey, I wouldn't consider myself a subject matter expert on sexual health by any means. I think this, uh, just from what I heard and from my perspective, uh, luckily uh, my, my injuries were, were, were my you know, lower limbs. Uh, I have met uh, several young service members um, who are uh, quite embarrassed and, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're struggling. And I don't know, I mean, luckily for me, I didn't sustain injuries or I didn't, I didn't really have a lot of problems. Of course, there, there's, there's uh, problems that come about with, with depression and, and things like that. But... Uh, I don't know, I, I can't speak to it a whole bunch. Maybe there's somebody that... Uh... So, so I've had, thank you for bringing that up. It's a, it's a very, very important aspect uh, when we're talking about IED-based injuries. There's, you know, a, a definitely a cadre of service members that sustain lower extremity amputations and also external genitalia amputations. Um, we have a, uh, actually a funded research protocol um, looking at... Um, First, getting our hands around the statistics, but also looking at ways that we can improve the system and then move on to improve reconstructive mechanisms. Fortunately, you know, we have a very strong uh, collaboration with the UK, and the UK actually is advanced over our knowledge in this field because they're able to funnel basically all of their trauma patients through one multidisciplinary panel. And they have a multidisciplinary panel dedicated to um, sexual health, external genital trauma. And so they, they can follow every single patient through that one system. Here, we receive the patients, but they get distributed throughout the US. So it's harder to get our hands around all of the, uh, the service members who, who are in this category. Um, they, they are advanced in their, in their communicative skills with regard to uh, dealing with this sometimes sensitive problem. And I, and I had the, the fortunate experience to go over there and, and see their multidisciplinary clinic. And it's phenomenal, you know, the conversation, the very open conversations that are had that are necessary to, to really assess the needs of the patient. Is it a fertility issue? Is it a sexual function issue? Um, these are all, they're, they're very different concerns to some people and, and our, uh, suppositions about what their concerns are may be very different than their actual concerns. So um, it's, it's a very fortunate collaboration we've had with the UK to enlighten us about um, this type of combat injury. Uh, Dr. Dr. I'll, I'll just kind of talk about at least what we see, um, you know, for some of these injuries, even, even you know, um, a couple of years out sometimes. So I think the hard part is, um, you know, because we, uh, our, uh, our goals are always patient-driven goals, so um, we, we want to focus on what they want to focus on um, during their time in rehabilitation. Um, so if that is something that's very concerning to them, it by all means is actually one of the um, top priorities for us, and, and they um, you know, do get um, you know, assessed by obviously our psychologist, our neuropsychiatrist, if we're looking at different medications, um, and then we also get other services um, involved. Um, and there is um, education um, done. I guess ma majority of the time what I've actually seen is that tends to not be one of their highest priorities during that rehabilitation phase. They're much more focused on the physical and cognitive aspect of getting um, better. Um, we, we still educate on it. It just doesn't uh, seem like um, acutely that is um, the uh, the goal that most of them have. Um, but we do give them the opportunity when they come in for all of our follow-ups. We usually have um, a, a sheet that we um, want them to fill out and tell us what is it that you would like for us to address you know, today. Um, and if, if that does come up, and, and it does, 
um, we uh, refer them you know, to the right you know, people and give them the education that we can um, have. Great. You know, um, I, uh, I'm the device guy, right? So uh, I, I will get that sometimes. It's always on the side. It's always kind of on the sly. There's a bit of embarrassment about it, except if it's someone who's particularly you know, verbose anyway. But I've made prosthetic devices that would have adaptations for them, basically to protect their limbs during uh, activity, but also to maybe help position them differently. Uh, if someone has uh, bilateral above knee amputations, and I mean, it, I'll be honest, it's not a, it's not a 100% comfort zone for, for most folks to talk about. And uh, I don't, you know, in, in, in our world, in our medical world today, and confidentiality and, and you know, liabilities and such, I don't introduce the subject, to be honest with you. Um, it's available to talk about. It is talked about all the time. Um, and, and a lot of times uh, that'll be when I come into a room and I have four or five guys in there. And I'm working on somebody, and they're they're exchanging, you know, s stories. I guess you would say, but but there have been times, plenty of times, I've done prosthetic devices, uh, not primarily for sexual activity, but I might do a design a little bit different if they're going to talk about I want to get in this position or that position, and uh, it, it's you know, or I say you know. Protecting your, the skin on your residual limb is paramount to being able to ambulate. So in all of your activities, here are some limb protectors to use. Here are some other things to use. Because I'll have guys come in with, a, with, a, with an abrasion on their limb, and I know they haven't been walking. And so I said, for the record, I know what this abrasion's from. And then the, then the doors are open. We can talk about a little bit how to protect their limbs during other activities. I was just going to add one other thing. Um, so spinal cord injury is actually very good at this, and they've been doing this for a long time. I think in the um, the TBI world, we still have some, uh, you know, something that we can learn from the spinal cord injury centers. Um, but in addition to that, though, our, our therapists do actually work, if, if this is brought up as one of the goals of our um, service members or veterans, um, our therapists can help them if they do have um, some significant um, orthopedic injuries. Um, or they're having, suffering from pain, our therapist can work with them on coming up with different types of positions. So. Thanks, Dr. Alnai. Any, okay, Jack, Dr. Smith? Yes, uh, hi, Dr. Jack Smith. I uh, work for Dr. Woodson doing health policy at Health Affairs. Uh, I, I wanna thank the panel uh, for, for uh, sharing with us, uh, particularly Mr. and Mrs. Baggy. Uh, and uh, what we've heard, I think, has, has been uh, a great uh, summary of, of the complex and, and rich uh, diversity of services that are available to people who've been wounded uh, uh, on the battlefield. Uh, I heard, too, though, for, particularly from Ms. Baggy, uh, the frustrations of having to serve as your own uh, case coordinator, your own advocate, uh, and so on. And I wanted to bring back uh, the discussion to something that Dr. Halmai mentioned uh, with the lead coordinator model, because uh, it has been recognized that, that we have, in spite of all of the things we've mobilized to meet the needs of wounded warriors and their families, we've oftentimes not done a sufficient job of, of listening to them about what their needs are, of coordinating the many, uh, the many services that are out there. And, uh, uh, what we heard from a GAO report a few years ago was that there were great services, yes, but also bewilderment uh, because of the endless parade of people who were coming to pri provide services. Uh, in response to that, uh, DOD and VA leadership have worked together to create uh, the Interagency Care Coordination Committee, uh, which has created a patient-centered uh, complex care coordination model, uh, which, which has created the lead coordinator concept, so that ideally now, someone who's arriving at that early stage will have the interdisciplinary team gathered around them, uh, but headed by a lead coordinator who will be the primary point of contact with the family. And together with the family and the service member, they will decide what what are my goals and objectives? What is my recovery plan? Uh, where do I want to go? And particularly at those transitions between DOD, if you're at Walter Reed and now you're going to a polytrauma center, 
uh, if you're going back from a polytrauma center to some other level of care, uh, what, what are the opportunities for a warm handoff to make sure that, that the ball doesn't get dropped, that you don't have to, to necessarily be uh, the advocate. Yes, you, you need to advocate for yourself always, uh, but that you all also have partners in this, and particularly in the form of the league coordinator. And I just want to finally say that, that the league coordinator concept is not just a, DO, uh, not just a VA program. Uh, this is something that DOD and VA have jointly decided to do. Dr. Almay again mentioned that, that the training is going out across the, the nation, but it is for uh, DOD facilities, it's for DOD to DOD transfers, uh, and in our relationships with the VA. And by virtue of that, uh, uh, the objective is to, is to more uh, smoothly uh, assist with those transitions and with the recovery plan so that hopefully the people uh, coming today with the kinds of injuries you've experienced will have uh, a smoother uh, experience and a, and a better quality of care. Thank you. No, thank you, Jack. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, next question, please. Yes, is there any over there? Yes, Marilyn? Or, uh, yep. Hi, I'm Ellen Melheiser, editor of Synopsis Newsletter. Um, Dr. Davis, I'm sure you're aware that earlier this week, the University of Maryland released findings from an Air Force study they did. I'm a journalist, I'm not a doctor, but it has something to do with the way oxygen is applied during air evacuation might actually make TBI worse. Have you seen this study and do you have any comments on it? Say the last portion of your question, I'm sorry. Has some, the study found that something about the way, and I don't understand the medical aspects, I apologize, something about the way oxygen is applied during the air evacuation out of field to land stool negatively impacts TBI recovery. Have you seen the study and do you have any comments? I, I have not seen this particular study, but there's a, a lot of research going on with the effect of uh, hy hypobaric environments and oxygen delivery. There's a lot of research in general about uh, does oxygen, we know we need oxygen, but does a hyperoxygenated environment create uh, an oxidative milieu that is actually detrimental? Um, so I, I can just tell you uh, this is not particularly my, my field of, of study, but uh, I know there is a lot of research going on to get at where you know, the fine line between the benefit and, uh, and cost of oxygen therapy. And it's complicated uh, by the physics of a hypobaric environment in transport, no doubt. No, just to add on to what Dr. Davis said, the Air Force up at Wright-Patterson at the 711th Human Performance Wing and their research is really, like Mike just said, is focused aggressively on the in route piece and looking at these sec potential second order effects. But I'm not familiar with that one study. I'll have to do some homework on to find out. What, it was from the University of Maryland, is what you said? Okay. Okay. So we'll take that one for follow up. Good question. Um, Dr. Yes. Hepburn? Can I? Yes. Ex pardon me. I just uh, wanted to point out for the uh, questioner, Dr. Hepper, and I, I'm not an expert on the study, but it, it was a, a study that was performed on a small number of rats. So it, it wasn't about the actual evacuation from uh, the f deployment theater to launch stool, I believe funded by the Air Force. Okay. But I think the conclusion was more that more research is required, kind of an initial finding yeah. that says, let's dig a little deeper. And we are, we as a DOD body uh, uh, are looking very aggressively at that in route piece to make sure, just as Mike had meant, Dr. Davis had mentioned that the level of care is never degraded from the, what was a de facto a level one trauma center forward to that flight back to Germany or in the future to the West Coast, Hawaii. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jerry Griffin, retired Army emergency physician. I'm just curious um, if the good sergeant and his lovely wife received couples counseling and couples together help, and if so, when did that start? How soon in the timeline of injury? Because the spouse is usually ignored, and it's the patient that gets all of the attention. In my view, one of the talks I give is that post-traumatic stress, I've tried to drop the D. <clears throat> um, PTS is a family affair, and it starts with a moment of injury, and the spouse and the family are usually ignored. 
So my question is, when did it start and did you get it? Um, we've, we've always been um, not embarrassed or ashamed to say we've sought out counseling. Um, we've seen several different counselors. Uh, we saw a counselor uh, when we were here at BAMC, uh, probably within, he was still in a wheelchair. So, uh, and then um, we've seen some back in Oregon. Uh, by far the most helpful was a counselor who practiced emotionally focused therapy. Uh, we've, you know, not, not every counselor can help every couple, um, but this, this person um, and that method was, was very helpful to us. I've never gotten any training on uh, what, any formal training on what to do, um, for instance, in a flashback situation, which has happened um, more than once. Uh, so that would be helpful um, to know uh, kind of what to do besides just leaving, um, you know, it is, there's, there has not been anything for me for that. Yeah, counseling, um, I'm, I'm really glad uh, that you brought that up. One of our concerns and, and challenges is to stay married. Uh, we live in a society where it's easy to just uh, get somebody new. And uh, we don't want to put our children through that, um, yet we acknowledge uh, PTSD. Um, just... My, uh, all these problems that come up, you know, you spend less than a year in a combat environment and you're screwed up for the rest of your life. Um, but yeah, I would say within a few months we sought out uh, counseling. And then when we got back uh, to the state of Oregon, uh, in fact, we, yeah, like my wife said, we sought it out several times. We sought um, it out. Yeah, we, uh, and of course it was paid for and provided by the VA in, in some and most circumstances. Um, I'm going off on a rabbit trail here, but um, pardon me. But I, I, I hope that gets you an okay answer. If I can say really quickly, I wanted to speak to what the doctor said earlier about <clears throat> helping from the beginning of injury. Um, <clears throat> the most helpful people that help, the most helpful to us were other service members that had the same injuries. So we will never forget our first peer visit from uh, a friend named Kevin, who walked into his hospital room, and we had never seen prosthetics, and he told us, he answered all the questions that were important to us that doctors couldn't answer, like, will I drive again? Will I, uh, will I have sex again? Like, there's just all these questions you ask that you feel are not important when a doctor who can kind of be intimidating comes in. Uh, and we had the opportunity and privilege to, to visit, to be peer visitors at BAMC, and that was by far the most rewarding thing for both of us that we've ever done. And I feel like service members like Christian and their spouses can be utilized uh, in that way um, to be like peer mentors, possibly to other guys, um, because we just have a different, we have a different, we're living it every day. Um, and that's not anything that any doctor can give, really, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, well, my, my concern was a, a timeline thing, you know, when did you get into the system to get the counseling? Because usually the focus is on, on the patient and, and not the spouse or the family. And my concern is the family as well, because they're a unit. And as you said, you work very hard at, at staying married. And, and that's part of the, that whole ball game to help you stay married and to help you overcome the issues that you have, uh, not just between yourself, but the injury, which is life-changing, okay? So you have to deal not only with, with that injury or your, your relationship as a couple, but with the loss of a former life. Do you know what I'm saying? So there's a grieving process that has to go on, and that's, that's the concern, and, and I don't know if that kind of counseling, that depth of counseling is being offered. I don't think that, I don't think that uh, the grieving process will never be over. We, we have different stages of life where we discover that we won't be able to do certain things with our kids or, you know, it, it's just we mourn at, at every stage of life things that we are not able to do. So I think that um, counseling services are not, you know, pushed on us. Um, I think that it's really important. I think that probably everybody that has injuries that, that is staying married should be in counseling. I think it's 
I cannot recall a time when somebody from uh, uh, the VA or the Brook Army Medical Center said at any point uh, that, that the spouses should get counseling. Yeah. Yeah. I, I cannot recall a time. In fact, we always sought it out. There were support groups, but there was not like one-on-one -on -one counseling. And if I could add just a little bit, so we've gotten better about that. Um, I still think that it is a, um, uh, an area within the VA that needs to grow significantly because the more that we've added it, the more we've actually seen the need for it and how much benefit it can provide. Um, I think we do a much better job when there's been um, a severely injured um, service member veteran coming through our programs because we can actually get uh, family therapy going pretty much from day one when they reach the rehabilitation uh, facility. Um, and then we follow them through um, until they're discharged back to wherever wherever it is they'll, they'll uh, move back to and we'll make recommendations regarding um, you know, ongoing services at that point. But in my opinion, family therapy has really been one of the, um, the, the greatest benefits that we've added to the program over the last several years. Um, I do think that it needs to grow a lot more um, in the world outside of the severely um, injured um, because, uh, because it's difficult whether or not you know, um, you have a bilateral amputation or you have a mild traumatic brain injury with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so um, I think we've, we've gotten a lot better, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. And yep. keep in mind, I'm sorry, keep in mind our perspective is, is 10 years old. No, all, all good points. And I, being a family physician, I would hope, I'm sure it is being extended to the children as well. And I think, Melissa, you touched on it with some of those spouses saw their father or mother being burned, so very good points. Yes, we have a question back there. Yeah, hi, Rob Mazzoli from the Vision Center of Excellence. Uh, some wonderful thoughts and, and thanks for the candor from the panel. The question that I have is we have made these wonderful advances in medical care. As you say, the, the only victor out of any war is the medical advances. How do we guarantee the sustainment and the institutionalization of, <clears throat> of the advances of the joint trauma system, the advances from that, that we've seen out of JTS, the polytrauma centers, whether it be the polytrauma approach within the DOD or even the establishment of the polytrauma centers in the VA, now that we're coming down out of a high intensity casualty producing environment into hopefully a long period of peace, which we know is gonna be interrupted probably sooner than later. But in that intervening time, what are we doing to ensure that the, the uh, advances of the JTS that we have seen that has given us a 98% success, casualty uh, success, the, the in integration of care management uh, in, a, in a systems level? And I would throw that there is a huge gap in sensory care coordination beyond the, the polytrauma, but uh, Mr. Mr. Baggy mentioned that, uh, that he was not able to see initially, and I would, and I would uh, offer that, that uh, vision care coordination is something that is more complex than it might seem. How do we institutionalize that in the peace years? Okay, well, why don't we let Dr. Davis start, and then I think, that's, John, you might have some thoughts, too. That's a fantastic question. Uh, if, you, if you look at... Uh, basically medical care in the interim between major conflicts, we inevitably slide back. And fortunately, we have a cadre of folks that are at the, at the programmatic level now that, that understand that and are big advocates for maintaining funding for uh, everything, again, from point of injury care through full rehabilitation. But it's important that we that we're cognizant of the tendency to, to fall back. And, and unfortunately, some of the, 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 the programmatic folks that, that are such advocates right now, that, that, kind of, that sort of thing is personality dependent. And these folks will transition at some point. It's, di it's very difficult to institutionalize. It's, it's incumbent upon everybody to, to socialize the need for uh, you know, leaders to understand that there's a tendency to slide back. Um, 
And with regard to, to the sensory side of things, I, I'm the first to admit that I've been remiss in advocating for, for you know, large funding for you know, whether it's hearing or vision. But fortunately, we're, we're catching up in, in terms of our knowledge of the, the tremendous research out there, either with regenerative medicine, regenerating retina, all the way through uh, true eyeball transplantation and co-opting the optic nerve to get true functional vision outcomes. We're not quite there yet, but there's a lot of work going on and there's a, a definitely attention towards the, the sensory side of the thing. I think from, uh, from uh, th this has been one of my concerns since I came here in 2004, because I was told then by, by a staff member in, when the prosthetics department was, was one, and uh, uh, I, he said, I don't, wh why do you want to come here? As soon as the war's over, they're going to tear it all down anyway. I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope we don't do that. And certainly the conflict went on probably longer than most people anticipated, but that's exactly the, the point we're at right now, where, where um, we're having to change some of our focus, obviously, and uh, at least at our particular center, um, you know, I've made an argument for, for years now that I've spent a, a decade building the staff and building expertise um, in high-level amputations, complicated cases, these kinds of things. Um, uh, let's not dismantle this. Uh, and so for us, a part of the way to not do that is that we have opened our doors more to people that we wouldn't have been able to have seen previously. Uh, beneficiaries or people who are eligible to be seen in a military treatment facility, I have space available to a certain extent now. Now, the other thing just to think about in terms of prosthetics in particular, I know that's not your exact question, but in prosthetics in particular is that um, San Antonio is a nice place to live. It's very vet friendly. It's military city. I mean, Christian and, and uh, Melissa both mentioned that. And so we have a lot of people who have stayed here, relocated here after coming in for medical services because now they have the Veterans Administration available to them. They have, they have uh, Brooke Army available to them. They, they can exercise their TRICARE options if they want to also. So uh, I have a lot of people. My workload hasn't changed very much in volume, to be honest with you. To some, it has gone down some, but the demographics look different now. Now, that's, that's a little more complicated for other services who, who are built upon new patients coming in, you, you complete the rehab and they move on. No one's going to bring their leg back anytime soon. And so um, my, my, the, the, the population my division serves has grown and grown. And it's, it's grown over the years because people stay. If they're driving distance, they're probably going to come back to us. And so um, it's not a question that anyone's unaware of by any stretch. And it's also an issue of uh, if, if we get consults into our center to vet those consults based on what services we can uniquely provide and continue to do that to keep our expertise ready and available once again. It's a volatile world. Uh, we could get in, into something again that would cause issue for, for us and a need for our services in a big way again. So it is a primary push for our, at least our center right now and it's been on the forefront of our minds for probably two years. No, that, that's a very pivotal question, the sustainment of these great systems that we've put in place and moving the art and science forward, very good point. And just to reiterate one thing that was mentioned earlier with Dr. Hendricks' point is that uh, from our international guests, the um, SAMC, the San Antonio Military Medical Center, uh, through agreement that was established years ago, can take civilian trauma patients, which is very unique, and Dr. Hendricks touched on it, but that's another adjunct to that front end of the from point of injury on into the longitudinal piece. Okay. I'm oh, yes, Dr. Cusman. Yeah. Uh, Mike Cusman, uh, uh, retired Army, and then uh, went to work in the VA in 2000 and uh, finished up as the undersecretary, but uh, lived through the development of all the things that you've heard from the, what the VA has had. And make no mistake, from a historical perspective, both DOD and the VA were caught a little flat footed. Uh, with this when the war first started because everybody thought it was going to be a rapid thing like Gulf War I. And it wasn't until 